how else should people, um, I, I guess, should women be thinking about training, fueling, specific to, I guess, where they may be within their menstrual cycle? This is an individual response. Like I said earlier, right, we don't have the robust studies to be able to quantify women. Uh, if you are using some of the new technology and you can actually pinpoint when you're ovulating, then you can look at some of the molecular aspects and say, okay, well, I've ovulated. I know progesterone is coming into play. I need more carbohydrate. I need more protein. Um, I'm going to sort of adjust depending on how I feel. I probably should try to do more steady state rather than high intensity. But for the most part, that's really complex and complicated. So what I tell women is, you know what? We say that day one is the first day of your bleed. Know how long your cycle is. Let's track it. If it is um, longer than 40 days, then we should really get you checked out. Knowing that your um, cycle varies a couple of days here and there, every cycle, that's normal. But I want you to see how you sleep, how you feel, and you'll start to find patterns in your own menstrual cycle um, month or weeks. And then you can pick out, you know what, on day 12, I always feel fantastic. I'm going to book my hardest meetings on that day. And I'm going to go train in the gym really hard so I can get that training stress. Because the idea of getting fitter is how much stress you can put on the body and recover from it. But maybe on day 21, you feel really flat. You're like, eh, I'm going to hide and work from home that day. And I'm going to go for some outside nature time to really help with parasympathetic and recovery. So women can pick out the days that they feel really fantastic and days they don't feel so great. And that's how we should really look at how we're training and pinpointing when we go hard. We want to go hard when our body can, is capable of being stress resilient and absorbing that and recovering from it. And then we don't want to push so much when we're already at that level of I'm not quite so stress resilient. I don't want to push myself into an overreached or uh, under recovered state because then we have ramifications forward that can really exacerbate all my normal life stress resilience as well. And Hugh, do you see the benefit in, of course, some of the wearables or a whoop that kind of allude to, I guess, the stress that or the strain that kind of one's body? And do you, do you see the accuracy in those things, or do you, I, I, or do you advocate against them? I can't get my words up. <laughs> I tell women to use them as a tool, but when we're looking at things like heart rate variability, especially in our reproductive years, uh, the algorithms don't capture it properly. The algorithms, again, are primarily written through, well, almost all algorithms on wearables are written through the male lens, looking at male physiology. We see inherent changes in our beat to beat for women to men. So for women, we have a different rhythm of beat to beat in our heart rate than what men do, and it gets read as an anomaly. We look at heart rate variability, and if you ovulate and have progesterone that comes up, progesterone uh, alters what we call our, our vagal tone or our vagal responses. So we have an increase in our resting heart rate. We have an increase in our resting respiratory rate, which is then read as a decrease in a heart rate variability. But that doesn't necessarily represent the entire body system. Like our muscles might not be affected. Our brain might not be affected. It's just progesterone's effect on one vagal nerve. So when I tell people, when you're looking at your wearable, you want to look at trends over time and see what your heart rate variability is doing across the month, because then you can see, are you actually adapting to the training or not? When we get into early and late perimenopause, we see a precipitous drop in heart rate variability because the hormones are so nefariously changeable that it can't actually be read by the algorithms. Um, one of the things that I do not let my athletes do is use a wearable in the week leading up to a major event because psychologically they will look at what the whoop or the aura is saying and take it on and go, oh, I'm not recovered enough. I'm not going to perform well. When actually it's not really a representation of what it, what's going on with their body. So again, it's a tool in the toolbox, but I think a lot of people look at their wearable and go, oh my gosh, I'm in the red. I can't do this today. It's like, no, let's take a step back. How do you actually feel? Let's see. And 
for men, you can put a little bit more buy-in into what the algorithms are saying because they're designed for that. And when we're looking at women, we have to take a pause and say, yep, okay, here's a tool in the toolbox. Let's look at my trends over time, but not actually what it's saying on the day. I think this is such an important point. And I've had this experience recently where I've woken up feeling fine and my data says you've slept poorly and I've suddenly started feeling really tired or I've woken up feeling tired and it says you've slept well and I've gone, okay, well, I feel fine. So clearly that has a very profound psychological component. And what you're saying is that for your athletes, especially for women, when you're gearing up for a competition that it's best to leave all that behind and not, not look at that. Exactly. Exactly. And for women, we know in about four to five days before their period starts, you cannot get into the green with the algorithms that are on the wearables because there's such a strong hormonal response of what's happening with progesterone had peaked and now your hormones are starting to drop. There's greater inflammation and it's changing all the systems in the body. That doesn't necessarily mean you can't perform because there isn't a day on any part of the menstrual cycle where you can't perform. It's the wearables are telling you that you're in the red and you're going to be like shit. So we're like, let's not pay attention to those few days before your period starts. I find that just so incredible that you have a design in which you would have, you know, 50% of the population that clearly there's a psychological component linked with the physical component that the device is stacked against them. They cannot be shown. Um, I know. It's frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've had lots of conversations. And when we look at the two major ones of Whoop versus Aura, right? Someone posted on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago about how Whoop was designed with the performance athlete in mind. So trying to now retrospectively fit a lot of the stuff that women want into it. Aura was designed with sleep in mind. And so now they are retro retrofitting physical activity. So when we're looking at the two devices, there are unique advantages to both of them and disadvantages to both of them. That said, when you're looking at the outcomes that are coming, we see Aura has a bigger vision to be able to tag women's health into it, Mm -hmm. where Whoop has the vision of high performance still. So there are nuances that are starting to happen in the wearables, but again, it's still, we have to look at it as a tool in a toolbox. 